Very good morning, uh, brothers, sisters in the Dhamma and friends. So the BJF has asked me to speak on this topic, uh, which is actually on the uh, Allah Gadu Pama Sutta. But it's a very long discourse, right? It's the sec 22nd discourse in the Book of Middle Lang saying. So I think it's going to be difficult to, to share the entire discourse in, say, 45 minutes. So what we'll do is we'll pick up two very important uh, points from this sutta. Uh, which is basically the first half of that discourse from paragraph 1 to paragraph 14. Then the paragraph 15 onwards, actually the, uh, the discourse talks more about uh, the concept of anatta, how do we understand non-self in terms of the five aggregates that we have and so on. Okay? So it's a very interesting discourse. Uh, it's called the simile of the snake and rat. So basically in this discourse, the Alangatupama Sutta, uh, there are two very important similes. But actually if you look at the Sutta, there are more than two similes. For example, at the beginning of it, there are actually ten similes. Right? And then even when it comes to the aggregates, there are different similes. So similes are a way of, uh, of uh, explaining the Buddha's teachings. I think a couple of months back, there was another discourse, BG, uh, Babs asked me to speak. It's called the simile of the vipers. <laughs> so we got a lot of... Uh, so in Buddhism, snakes and, uh, and vipers, they are not necessarily evil, right? Unlike, say, in Western uh, mythology, where dragons, you know, where the aim of the knight is to slay the dragon, kill the dragon. So in Buddhism, dragons or snakes, they're actually good, not necessarily bad, okay? <laughs> right. So today we're going to look at two very important uh, similes. It's called the simile of the snake and then the other simile of the rough. They're actually interrelated. But to do that, I think uh, I'll touch a little bit on the, on the background of the dis discourse, right? But be before that, I've got a shot right up here. And you can see both sides, right? Okay, so the Buddha used similes uh, to explain points of Dhamma, his teaching. So he used similes to explain his teachings. Uh, a lot of a lot of similes, right? So sometimes he would make an abstract point clear with a vivid and simple image. Sometimes he would tease out the implications of an image in a way that suggested many layers of meaning, right? Offering food for continuous thought. So as you know, the the the, the essence of the Buddha's teachings is not something for us to come and just believe blindly, right? So, is to investigate for us to find out, to inquire. That is why you have the famous uh, Kalama Sutta, all right, or the Vimamsaka Sutta, which actually talks about the nature of inquiry. All right? And uh, you also know that, for example, in the seven factors of enlightenment, after mindfulness, we are supposed to cultivate the investigations, all right, Dhamma Vichaya. So, a lot of all these things tells you that it is very important for us not just to believe whatever we, we have heard or has been said, but to go back and investigate, all right? So similarly, the Buddha gives similes so that we will reflect, we will contemplate on the similes that we have heard, yeah? Okay, so some of his similes provided answers, whereas others, they provoke questions, right? Sometimes the answers are pretty straightforward, but sometimes they are just uh, questions. Remember the, the other very famous simile, the, uh, the simile of the Singsapa groove, where once the Buddha, probably during autumn, when a lot of leaves had fallen on the ground, and he picked up a handful of leaves, and he asked the monks who were gathered there, which is more, the leaves that I have in my hand, or the leaves that you find on the ground? All right? And of course, the monks say, oh, Bhante, you know, the leaves that you have in your hand is less compared to the leaves on the, on, on the ground. So the, the simile of that, that parable of the Sinsapa groove is to say that we should only go for what is really essential for our study and our practice of the Dharma? There are many, many things there. All right? Like, for example, even the second of the seven factors of enlightenment, we thought investigation of Dharma. So it is said that there's so many Dharmas out there. But what type of Dharma should we investigate? So we investigate Dharma which is wholesome, which is unwholesome, which causes dukkha or which causes suffering, what does not cause suffering. What kind of, of dharma when practice leads to happiness? What kind of dharma that does not lead to happiness? So dharma here would be translated as, for example, um, mental qualities or mental activities. So what kind of mental activities that we have that will lead to happiness, lead to our happiness, or lead to more suffering? 
Okay, so the Buddha always emphasized the importance of that investigative uh, attitude of mind. Right? So he uses similes. So similes help to explain that. So let's give you just a background. Why uh, in the Buddha's teachings, in the 45 years of teaching, you find that there are so many similes, isn't it? Right? Okay, so let's just very quickly look at the, some background because the background is necessary for us to, uh, to understand how he arrived or why he, he brought up the issue of the parable of the snake or the simile of the snake. Okay? Now, the Alagadu Pama Sutta is also known as the Discourse on the Water Snake. So this is found in MN22. Uh, MN here means the middle uh, of Majjhima Nikaya. You know the Buddhist teachings, right? Our, this, our teachings are actually uh, contained in what is called discourses or in the suttas, right? Or sutras in Sanskrit, so suttas. And we have five main collections. So this is the middle length collections. And I think there are, what, 152 discourses there. So we are looking at sutta number 22. So this discourse is about clinging to views, about diti, about views, right? Its central message is conveyed in two similes, the water snake and the raft. So that's the background. Now, both similes focus on the skill needed to grasp right view properly as a means of leading to the cessation of suffering, rather than as object of clinging and then letting it go when it has done its job. Right. So this kind of uh, summarizes the whole, the whole essence even of the Buddha's teaching itself. Okay? So you remember in the Noble Eightfold Path, which is the which is the first, which is right views, isn't it? So as teachers would would have told you that while meditation is very important, and there's no question about it that meditation or mindfulness is very important. But if that is not balanced, if, but if that's not rooted in right understanding, in diti, then it's not going to make, it's not going to be very efficacious. It's not going to be very effective in your spiritual development. All right. So it's not how long you can sit in meditation, but during your sitting in meditation, whether do you, do you do it with right view, right understanding. So that is really crucial, right? Um, in the Tibetan tradition, we talk about emptiness, right? I always remember Lama Zopa, the late Lama Zopa always said, because Lama Zopa is a great meditator, right? and so, so are many of his teachers, he said, or his students. <clears throat> And he said, it is very important for us to practice meditation. It's very important for us to, to sit. But if you have no realization of emptiness, then your meditation is actually of not much use. Right? So in, in maybe in the Pali tradition, we talk about uh, DT, about views, all right? the importance of views. So this discourse is also about that. So we will, we will, we will see how, that is why it's subtitled as uh, uh, skillfully holding on and letting go. All right? Because sometimes, we have this, uh, this, this cliche that, what is the purpose of Buddhism? Let go. Everything you let go, you know, and what is left? <laughs> you let go of everything. So they say, oh, you let go of, of, of everything. You even let go of the wholesome states. You let go of the wholesome deeds that you're supposed to do. They say, you let go of the self. Then you let go of the self. Then what's going to happen? Right? In, the, in many discourses, the Buddha said, we are heirs to our karma. So we are, you know, we are what, what, what we do, what we think, what we say. So you even let go of, of that, then you adopt what the Buddha called a nihilistic perspective of, of things. So we've got to be very careful, right? Achantani Saro, he likes to say, you know, we, we cling on to the small self first, then later we let go, then the big self will disappear, right? So, so this discourse is actually a little bit about that. Okay, so let's, let's, let's go on with this. Huh? Now, if you are interested in this discourse, there are four main sections. Okay, so today we're just going to cover the first three. Right? The last section from para 15 onwards actually is about non-self and how non-self is understood in terms of the five aggregates, the pancha kandas. Right? So it's a full detail. I think the whole sutta is about 46 or 47 paragraphs. So, we are, so today we are covering the first 14 paragraphs, right? which talks about the background, which is uh, you know, how this discourse came about, and then the parable of the water snake, and then the parable of the rough. Okay? So I just, just for your information, there are five sections in this discourse. So at some stage, you know, maybe you can have a, a, a proper sutta class. Then we can look at the, the <coughs> this discourse in full, and then you know, it, it will take definitely more than 45 minutes. <laughs> 
So first of all, who is Arita? Because the, this discourse is centered on this monk called Arita. In, um, I don't think you find his name appearing anywhere else in the in the in the canon other in this discourse. Of course, the commentary says that uh, that's because after this he was uh, he was uh, kind of uh, disrobed. He was asked to disrobe. So according to the commentary, Arita is a learned exponent of the Dhamma and is quite familiar with the obstructions or the hindrances, right? The hindrances. However, being less learned in the Vinaya, he holds a view that sexual indulgence is not a hindrance to spiritual development and that one can enjoy sex without sexual desire or feeling. Now, this is not explicit in the Sutta. You read the Sutta, it doesn't talk about all those things. This is in the commentaries. All right? So the commentaries explain. Even if you look at the Chinese version, there's a Chinese version of the Alagadupama Sutta uh, is in the Chinese Agamas. Right? In the, also in the Majima, the, the, the Sanskrit version of Ajima Nikaya, I think it's Sutta, it's Sutra 220. So if you're interested, there's also a Chinese version, which is uh, in the Agamas. And it talks also in the not explicit, but there it was more explicit about sensual indulgence. Sensual indulgence, right? So the, the beauty of uh, when you're able to compare both the Pali Sutta and the Agamas and the, and the Sanskrit version, you find a lot of similarities. All right? So that gives you a lot of confidence that actually what the Buddha said is, is actually the, the truth. Because you know the Pali Nikayas, the Chinese Agamas, they are they discovered different parts of India. And yet, very interestingly, they, they all share the same message. All right? Oh, it's okay. It's okay. No, I can do it. <laughs> all right. And you know, recently there's, they also they discovered that there are new scriptures, or new new scriptures been discovered in a place called Gandhara, right? And it's in Gandhari script. <laughs> so they were asking uh, the one of the pioneers of who discovered it, uh, Professor Richard Solomon. He said, you know, in the Gandhari script, they, they have, for example, the Rhinoceros Sutta, the Kaga Visana Sutta. It's also found in the Gandhari script. And they asked him, do you discover anything in the Gandhari script where the Buddha talks about uh, five noble truths or three noble truths? <laughs> he said, no. He said, even in the Gandhari script, all they had come through, the Buddha still talks about four noble truths. There's no five noble truths, there's no three no noble truths. So which means that the Eightfold Path is still there. So that is the consistency of the Buddha's teaching, which you can find uh, in, in different um, scriptural traditions whether it's Pali or in the Agamas, or even now, as you say, in the Gandhari. Okay? Of course, later Mahayana scriptures is a different thing. All right? When I say later, you know, like for example, the Lotus Sutra, the, uh, the, the, the Amitabha Sutras, they are much later. So different time as the Agamas. Okay? So just a, just a background. So this Sutra itself, you can also find it in the Chinese Agamas. So you find the name Arita also appearing there. So Arita's wrong view. So, so what is his argument? Okay, Arita's argument is, here the monk, having gone into seclusion, reasons as follows. They are lay people enjoying the five senses, who are stream enterers, once returners. I, I think the non-returners shouldn't be there. Actually, it's both the stream enterers, once returners. Some they have excluded the non-returners because it is said that if you attain, you can still you can still uh, lead a lay life, right, and be a stream enterer and be a once returner. Okay, so that's mean. As for monks, they see pleasurable forms, recognizable through the eye, ear, the, the six senses. Yeah, they use soft covers, including all this is proper. So what Arita is saying that look, the Buddha has got has has said that for the lay people. Uh, they don't need to, to abstain from the sex, which is the, like you recited the, the five precepts this morning. It is abstaining from sexual misconduct, not abstaining from sex. Right? Abstaining from sexual misconduct in Pali is kame sumichachara, right? But in the, for the monastic, it is abramacharya. So it's a different word altogether. And the Buddha was very specific that he had set different guidelines for lay people, he set different guidelines for monastics. In other words, he, he knows that we need these different layers because people have different layers, different levels of development. Some people, 
you know, they will start off as lay people, as lay practitioners. But he also introduced, for example, on new moon days, full moon days, the eight precepts. So they want to further enhance their, their you know, their, their practice. Okay, but for the monastics, he made it very clear that if you follow the monastics, then the third precept becomes abrahmacharya, which is no abstinence from sex. So, Arita, right, he took the other way and he said, look, if lay people, you know, by observing just the Kame Sumichachara instead of abrahmacharya, if they can also become stream enterers, they can become non-returners, so why did the Buddha make it so difficult for the monks? And let us also, you know, we can have, we can go to the nearest town, you know, find a nice woman, you know, and, and get married. So, but the Buddha, the Buddha has, was very explicit that he has given this as a, as a rule for the monastics. So, the, the Vinaya, ex, ex, in, again in the Sutta, nothing is, is mentioned details. So, announcement in the Chula Vaga of the act of suspension on Arita for refusing to give up his false views, right? So he was suspended. In the Sutta Vibhanga of his commission of an offense, extilling uh, expiation, pachitiya, on refusing to do after repeated admonitions. So he did not commit parajika because he did not commit that, that bring back. He was uh, a view, so it's a, it's a second level. It's called a pachitiya. So he was uh, kind of uh, uh, punished based on that. Okay, so this is how we get from the sutta itself. The details are not there, so we don't know what actually happened. So again, we are depending on commentaries. Now you may have some teachers who said, "Don't listen to the commentaries." Isn't it? Some teachers only go to the suttas. So you only go to the the, the, the suttas itself. Then then you, you you don't know what actually transpired, but the commentaries give you further explanation. Okay, so again, as I say, you want details. Uh, there are two very good. Uh, uh, I think that there's a very good write-up by a translation by Venerable Nyana Ponika. Right? You can get it almost free online. And he and Venerable Nyana Ponika also gives a detailed introduction, explanation of this sutta. But if you don't like to read, you would prefer to listen. I think Bhikkhu Bodhi has got a, has got a five-part uh, series explaining explaining the Alaga, the, uh, explaining this sutta itself, so in five sections, all right? So you, you can also uh, look at that. Of course, the other translation is by Bhante Sujato, Sutta Central. So, th so these are some of the translations which I think would, would be highly recommended, right? Because, you know, today there are so many translations, right? so we've got to be very careful who does the translation, right? <laughs> Isn't it? Uh, so you prefer to get the... Uh, say, a, a, a scholar who does a translation, but who is also a practitioner, isn't it? So that, that's how we, we, we tend to uh, make reference to, to those discourses, okay? So this is about Arita. But the purpose today is not so much to talk about this, just the, the background, right? So I just want to talk a little bit about this point about sexuality in the, in the Vinaya. So the Buddha explained the disadvantages of sensual pleasures in 10 parables. So again, we don't have time to go into all these 10 parables. And that there can be no sexual act without sexual desire. So when one is bound by delight and lust, one loses one's freedom of body, speech and mind. One deeds, uh, one's deeds, words and thoughts will be colored by lust and sexuality. So this is explained, for example. So abstaining from sex is the first of the 227 rules for monks in the Theravada tradition. Likewise, even in the Mahayana tradition, those who observe the celibacy rules, so they also observe this. So it's not only in the Theravada tradition, right? Now, in the laity, which concerns all of us here, right, is that uh, there, are source, there are two main sources. One is the Dhammika Sutta, and but I make reference to the Abhisanda Sutta. So again, you can read the Abhisanda Sutta. This is in the Book of Eight. So there are supposed to be eight gifts. And this is one of the gifts, right? The Abhisanda. So it says in abandoning illicit sex or sexual misconduct, the disciple of the noble ones give freedom from danger, from animosity, from oppression to limitless numbers of beings. And in giving freedom from danger, animosity, oppression to limitless number of beings, he gains a share in limitless freedom from danger, animosity. So here, from by looking at this sutta, we know for sure that the Buddha uh, has got uh, has got a slightly separate. Uh, uh, guidelines for lay people, all right, for lay people. So this is 
So if you ask where did the five precepts actually come from, right? So this is you look at the Abhisanda Sutta. So details are there. Now the other one, of course, will be the uh, the, the Dhammika Sutta, and I think even in the Dikha Janus Sutta, which I believe has been discussed here, the, about the, the eight the eight types of happiness: four worldly happiness, four um, spiritual ha ha happiness. So as a lay person, he practices that. The, the five precepts. Okay? It is said that originally they focused on the four, and then the fifth one was added in. So today we have five. Okay? Right. So for lay people, the Buddha is, is not expecting lay people to follow what monastics are supposed to follow. Right? Because if you mix them up, then you then you you also run into problems. If the if the monastic starts saying that, oh, I practice the lay precepts then there's going to create a lot of chaos in the, in the monastic order. And likewise, lay people, if they have families, if they've got children, they've got spouses, if they also follow the, the, the monk's precept, then they have, to, they have to change the whole lifestyle, isn't it? All right? So that's why the Buddha was very explicit about that. Okay? Right, so then with this, we look at the parable of the snake. Now, the simile of the snake is about the danger of misapprehending the Dhamma especially the teachings on sensuality. It is then followed by the simile of the rough. So you see how it leads on. First, you have Arita who talks about sensuality, why he's saying that it's okay you know, for, for monks even to indulge in sense, uh, sense desires, sense pleasures. But the Buddha says uh, that's a wrong view. All right? that's, a, that's a wrong view. Okay? And, and the Buddha emphasized so much the importance of views that he says that's actually the, the, the first thing we must have when we practice, when we go on the path. That's why the, the Eightfold Path. So one can interpret the rough, simi the, the rough simile as meaning that one is to get, let go of the rough in order to cross the river. But taken together, both similes set the stage for the rest of the discourse, which focuses on teaching on non-self. So, so this one will be after para 15, where the Buddha talks about the, 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 the illusion of the self, the self-image, right? Where is, is, is boiled down to three things where you think, like, you, we always think this is mine, this is I, this is myself. <laughs> so they, they inter, interplay these three ideas into the five aggregates. Right? So, but today we will not look at that. It's para 15 onwards, as I said. Yeah? So let's look at para 10, which is about the snake. So this is from the text itself. Huh? Here, because some misguided men learn the Dhamma, again, yeah, the, the nine sections of the Dhamma is in the early Buddhist context, right, in terms of discourses, stanzas, expositions, and, and so on. And having learned the Dhamma, they do not examine the meaning of those teaching with wisdom. Right? So that's a very important point for us to, 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 to remember. He says, some misguided men. In other words, they learn the they learn the Buddha's teaching. But what is the purpose of the learn the Buddha's teachings? What is the purpose? All right. Um, they said in the again in the commentaries, they explain they learn the Buddha's teachings because so that they can enter into debates. So they can debate with other people and prove that um, you know, see what I believe my teachings is more superior. Now that is very much in line with the Indian tradition during the Buddha's time, you, you must have read during the Buddha's time, a lot of debates, right? Even in the king, you know, you find that the, the, the king will invite all the wise people come to his court and then they'll debate. Uh, whoever loses the debate, maybe get the head chopped off, you know? So you be very, very careful that you win, win the debate. So it is a tradition. During the Buddha's time, you remember there are a lot of, uh, uh, of uh, debate between the monks and, for example, other religious teachers during the Buddha's time. People like who? People like the, like the Jains, right? The Jains, and then you've got the, the naked ascetics, the Ajivikas, right? So they always de de debate, isn't it? But of course, we always find that we always win the, win the, win the, win the debates, right? Okay. So here he said, having learned the Dhamma, they do not examine the meaning of those teachings with wisdom, all right? So this is a very important part. You, you can we can analyze it, they do not examine the meaning of those teachings. In, in other words, when we study the, the, the teachings, like today, you know, you're listening to a talk, say, on the Alugadu Bama Sutta, what should we do after that? Our, our attitude is, okay, this is what I've heard. It's for me to go back and reflect on it. 
some sources are mentioned for, for, for me to go back to the original this discourse and see what actually is the hidden meaning be, behind it. All right. So just now I start, I, I talk about investigating the Dhamma. Remember, Dhamma Vichaya. So we must always have that. But before we can do that, we must have mindfulness. That's why the seven factors of enlightenment start with mindfulness, isn't it? We must be, be, be aware of what we are studying. <laughs> we must be aware. So we investigate. Then we investigate, for example, what we hear today. Does it, uh, is it in line with what I've heard previously? Is it in, in, in line with the other teachings that I've heard? And then you make reference to maybe the, the discourses. Is there a contradiction in what I've, I've read in the, the discourses? If there's no contradiction, okay. That's so why in the Kalama Sutta, the Buddha said, do not accept anything as true or as just because it's passed down from tradition, but because you, you know it, it agrees with it, it, it agrees with what the, the, the wise have been saying, you know, and the, what you have been reflecting on, then you accept it, then you, you, you continue. So, that, so that's a very important part, yeah? There's a very famous uh, Tibetan text called the Abhisai, Abhisamaya Alankara. Now, there's a very important, it's not the Pali text, uh, it's a, one of those Sanskrit texts, where His Holiness the Dalai Lama would always use that when he gives a teaching. And, that, and in that teaching, he says there are four things we should always rely on. The first thing is rely not on the person, but on the words. All right, later you reflect. <laughs> Rely not on the person who is giving you the talk, but rely on the words. Second, rely, rely not on the, on, the, on, 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 on the words, but on the meaning of the words. That's the second reliance. The third reliance, rely not on the literal meaning of the word, but the definite, the definitive meaning of, of the word. And finally, rely not just on your theoretical understanding, but rely on your practical applications of those teachings you put into practice. And I think that's a very wonderful, even though that's not from the Pali tradition, it's from the Abhis Samaya Alankara, which is uh, attributed to Maitreya. So I think it's a very wonderful advice, injunction to all of us here who likes to listen to Dhamma talks, <laughs> who likes to attend Dhamma teachings. So always remember that. Rely not just on the words that you hear. Just because the speaker is uh, makes a very interesting talk, you see, very jovial, you laugh, you know, and then you ask, what did you, you listen? Don't know, lah. I remember a very good, very interesting talk. I, I laugh a lot, you know, <laughs> or a lot of jokes. What joke? The joke, so you cannot remember, really. <laughs> so rely not on the person, but on the words. Then rely not on the words, but on the meaning. When Mr. So-and-so or Venerable So-and-so said something, what is the meaning of, of, of that? And then, is it a literal meaning or is it a definitive meaning? Like for example, self. All right? We need a self, isn't it? We are heirs to our own dharma, we are heirs to our own action. So we have a self. Now that's a literal meaning. In the ultimate meaning. Or as in the Visuddhi Maga, it says, there is, there is an act, but there's no actor. There's a doing, but there's no doer. You know? Or in the Dhammapada, there's one saying which says, Kill mother, kill father, kill the two Brahmins and kill the Kastriya king. So does it mean that you go start, start committing matricide and patricide? <laughs> no, right? So uh, again, those five are what? Your five hindrances. You say your five hindrances, your panchanivaranas. So you kill mother, kill father, <laughs> kill the two, two Brahmins and then you kill the Kastriya king. You practically kill everybody. That means you kill all the five hindrances. So in the, if you go to a Chinese Buddhist temple, you have a, a statue of Manjushri. You know who is Manjushri? Manchu, right? The Bodhisattva of, of wisdom. And, Man, and Manchu looks very fierce with a sword. All right? So you think, well, all, all Buddhists, from now on, onwards, if I follow Mahayana Buddhists, I should carry a sword. <laughs> like Manjushri, you know, like the, like the Sikh, isn't it? <laughs> Some Sikh, right? They, they carry a sword. But no, but that is a sword of wisdom. In other words, that sword is to cut off delusion, to cut off the hindrances, cut off all the obstructions. So we have to see in a very symbolical manner. Right? So His Holiness says that that's the fourth one. All right? Not just a literal meaning, but the definitive meaning. And finally, 
whatever meaning, whatever literal or definitive, are we able to put it into practice? Today, we all recited the five precepts. Are we able, for example, to at least practice the five precepts? If not five, at least four. If not four, at least three. <laughs> right. Isn't it? Right? Rather than say, oh, you know, it, it, it's, you know, just... Uh, so th that's why here he says, some misguided men, they learn the Dhamma. They can learn the discourses, they can learn the stanzas, they can learn exposition, they can learn verses. Maybe they can even write a PhD thesis, you know, on, 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 on that. But having learned the Dhamma, they do not practice it, right? And also in the Dhammapada, the Buddha says, one who learns a lot but don't practice is like the cowherd who every morning, you know, he, he goes to the pasture, then he counts, oh, my neighbor has got so many sheep. Oh, this neighbor has got so many goats. Oh, that neighbor has got so many cows. But he himself has got none. <laughs> but he knows how many sheep the neighbor has, how many goats the neighbor has, how many cows the neighbor has. But he himself, he has none. Right. So, the, so the Buddha makes use of all those illustrations to, to say that while it is important for us to study the Dhamma, all right, we should always examine it. Okay? Of course, sometimes people take it to the other extreme. They say, okay, so no need to study the Dhamma. Just practice. Just meditate. Just practice. If you do that, then you don't know what, what on earth you are meditating on. Then right views would, 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 would set in that. Isn't it? I always said, you know, if the Buddha felt that study is not important, would he have said, Pariyati, Patipati, and Pativeda. You know this three word? It doesn't mean that we all go for parties. No? <laughs> and that's the motto in USM we adopted when, you know, when I was a student. Pariyati, Patipati, Pativeda. That's the, um, so the students say, wow, this is a great society to be in, lots of parties. <laughs> so Pariyati means you've got to study the Dharma. Pariyati. Patipati means you've got to put it into practice. Right? And again, putting into practice has got so many different meanings. Right? As I said, of, of course, devotions is one of it. This morning we did puja, that's practice. We meditate, that's practice. Kindness, compassion, that's practice. Right? So all these are, are, are practices. Right? And finally, we realize it. Right? When, when the day comes, you, know, you don't need to recite the five precepts. You will automatically just practice the five precepts. And that's when you actually realize the nature of it. And that can happen. Why? Because we have a mind that can transform ourselves. Like, for example, this morning, I'm sure when you wake up, what is the first thing that, that, that you did? Huh? When, you, when you wake up, first thing, where do you go? You go to the toilet, what, 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 what do you do? I mean, other than going to, to you, you brush your teeth, right? Isn't it? Or do you eat first and brush teeth? I think Malaysian, we brush this first and eat, right? But were you able to do that when you were, uh, were uh, a little child? No, isn't it? You wake up, your parents would have to tell you, go and brush your, your, your teeth. But today, your, would your parents still need to tell you, hey, wake up, please brush teeth? <laughs> no, right? Right, you, you don't, because it becomes second nature now. So likewise, the, the Buddha is saying, we should cultivate habits. We should cultivate habits. And this are uh, what is called habits. Uh, keeping the precepts, observing the precepts, reciting the precepts on a regular basis. Right? So all those are habits. And when you do that long enough, we develop tendencies. And the Buddha even have a word for it. It's called anusayas. Some of you have heard of it, right? Anusayas. So when you cultivate, when you reach the stage when you have that anusayas, that means it becomes very natural. Natural. Is, uh, in the Tibetan, they call it natural unfolding. It's a natural unfolding. Right. So we, we aspire towards that. Okay? So re remember the Abhisam Samaya Alankara uh, advice, which His Holiness always gives each time when we listen to, to a talk. Right? So always remember the words, always remember the meaning, always remember the definitive meaning, and after that, always try to put it into practice. Right? So that is the, the, the real uh, when we actually practice. Okay? So instead, they learn the Dharma only for the sake of criticizing others. You know, some people they like to, they, they like to have a one uh, one man up, uh, what what they call it, one man up, show, one up man show, one up man show, think, or one man show, <laughs> one man up show, <laughs> right? There's you know some people without realizing it, you know, only my meditation method is correct because my meditation teacher is the best. All other meditation te teachers are no good. All meditation methods. Uh, in, in inferior, right? 
the Buddha, actually, you look at his teaching, he never said that. He never said that. All right? So we've got to be very, very careful about that. All right? That's why it's called skillful. We must be very skillful. If we're not realizing it, we're actually getting very egoistic about that. All right? So instead, they learn the Dharma only for the sake of criticizing others and for winning in debates. And they do not experience the good for the sake of which they learn the Dhamma. All right? It is said that if, if today you have a lot of negative thoughts, you have a lot, you're easily angry, you're e e easily you know, full of greed, very lustful. So after studying the Dhamma, after practicing the Dhamma, if those qualities increase, that means <laughs> something is not right. But if after studying the Dharma, after practicing meditation, you find that you're able to reduce your anger, you're able to reduce your, 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 your greed, for, for, for example, you're now able to practice more patience, you're more kind, you have more compassion now. That means, that means you are progressing. That is the sign of progress. Okay? That's a sign of progress. So, who, who knows? Only you would know, isn't it? And it happens only in your mind. Not how you talk. Some people, after attending a retreat, they can say, Oh, you know, it's so wonderful. You know, everybody is so good, so kind. You know, I feel so much pity. You know, so Atisha, you know, Atisha, uh, Atisha Dipankara, the great Indian pundit who actually went to Indonesia in the eighth century, studied there under Serling Park. He said, in the Bodhisattva Garland of Gems, another very famous um, Mahayana Sutra, Bodhisattva Garland of Gems, you can Google that. And he says, when we are in the midst of many, when we are in the midst of many, always check your speech. Always be careful what you say. <laughs> right speech, isn't it? So when you're in the midst of many people. But if you're alone, what should you check? Check your mind. Right. That's not from me. <laughs> That's from Atisha. <laughs> Lord Atisha, uh, Lama Atisha. So remember, Bodhisattva Garland of Gems, Para 12. Right? He says, when you are in the midst of many people, be very careful what you say, right speech. But when you are alone, when there's nobody for you to talk to, always check your mind. Because you cannot cheat your mind. You see? Because that mind, remember in the Chulakama Vibhanga Sutta, Buddha says, we are heirs to our karma. We are heirs to our own karma. So nobody, right? So you may look like a very saintly person. People look at you, you can see a hollow there. <laughs> be very saintly person. But only you yourself know whether you are really a saintly person. All right? <clears throat> so, that's what the Buddha says. Always examine, right? Your mind, very important. These teachings been, uh, these teachings been wrongly grasped by them, conduced to their harm and suffering for a long time. Now he gives the simile. Suppose a man eating a snake, seeking a snake, uh, saw a large snake and grabbed his coil or his tail, he would turn back on him and bite his hand, arm or one of his limbs. And because of that, he would come to death or deadly suffering. Why is that so? Because of his wrong grasp of the snake. So too, some misguided men learn the Dharma, you know, all those nine things. Those teachings been wrongly grasped by them, conduce to their harm and suffering for a long time. So he is using the analogy that that if you study the teachings, all right, but your objective is all wrong, your motivation is all wrong, you use it because you want to show that you are a very superior person, you know so much of the teaching, you debate, you know, then you win the debate. So Buddha says that is not the right intention. That is, that is similar to you trying to catch a snake by the tail. What happens? The tail will turn around and bite you. Okay? All right, the next one. So now it's... Some clansmen learn the Dharma. Having learned the Dharma, they examine the meaning of those teachings and wisdom where they gain a reflective acceptance of them. So they reflect on, on, on what they have heard. So they reflect on it. They do not learn the Dharma for the sake of criticizing others. All right? So please don't go around criticizing other people just because they have a, 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 a different view. Right? Or for winning in debates. And they experience the good <clears throat> for the sake of which they learn the Dharma. Those teachings have been rightly grasped by them conduce to their welfare and happiness for a long time. So it's very important to have the right motivation why we are here to study the Dhamma. All right? Not to win debates, not to show that you know, we are more superior to other people. All right? So this is, if you read the end of the, the suttas, this is what, you know, remember I told you the, the three ways of, of this illusion of self. All right? This is mine, I am, 
this is myself. So the I am is the conceit. This is me. <laughs> I know so much. All right. But you do not know so, so much. So that's all. All those things are very necessary. So suppose a man needing a snake, seeking a snake, saw a large snake and caught it rightly with a cleft stick. And having done so, grabs it rightly by the neck. Then although the snake might wrap its coil around his hand, arms or limbs, still he will not come to death. He catch the snake by the neck. Right? So the snake will not turn around and bite him. Why is that so? <clears throat> because of his right grasp of the snake. So too, if you learn the Dhamma, those teachings rightly grasp, conduce to their welfare and happiness for a long time. All right? So very simple message that is very important for us to have a proper understanding of the teachings. Right? right views. Therefore, because when you understand the meaning of my statements, remember it accordingly. And when you do not understand the meaning of my statement, then ask either me about it. Of course, Buddha is not around. You can ask him. Or those bhikkhus who are wise. So you still got the teachers, uh, monks, nuns, right, who are around. So you, 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 you ask them. Okay? So it is said that <clears throat> one, way we, one way we learn the Dhamma yeah, to, 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 to get the, the, the truth of it, two ways. One is self-reflection. Right? Self-reflection. Which is, uh, we say, yoniso mana sekara, self reflection. This is what we have been saying about. You reflect on what you have heard. Now, the other one is you always consult. Uh, in the text, it says, Kalyana Mitas. Kalyana Mitas are not just ordinary friends, they are spiritual friends. All right? So, the spiritual, your, the, your, your, your Achan, your Sayadaw, they are also your Kalyana Mitas. You know, they are your Kalyana Mitas because they are the ones who guide you. Who, who provide you the right direction, all right? You know the 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 the, the word uh, geishi. You know some of you are familiar in the like in LDC, the Losan Drug Pass Center. The teacher there is called geishi. They call it geishi lah. So geishi actually is a Tibetan word for spiritual friend, for kalyana mita. You know the word geishi. You you heard right? You know? Okay. Okay. So the the word geishi is a Tibetan word which means uh, you know in in the Dalai Lama's tradition, the, the teachers, they spend many, many years studying and then practice, so they are called Geishi, the title. So it, the word Geishi means uh, uh, Kalyana Mita is a Tibetan word for Kalyana Mita. So the importance of a spiritual friend. So in the teaching, it says two ways. One is our constant reflection, all right? And secondly, it's always associated with spiritual friends. And also in the Mangala Sutta, isn't it? the Buddha says, one of the highest blessings is to associate with the wise. So all those things you see are consistency in the Buddha's teachings. Okay? So you're not sure, ask. Right? You must always ask. Okay? It is better to ask. And in the Buddha's teaching also, he says that if you ask many questions in this life, next life you're born very clever, very smart. So you don't ask questions in this life, next, next life, <laughs> bit <susah sikit>, lah. <laughs> so you better ask questions. All right, skillful means. So a snake like the Dhamma can, can save our lives uh, venom from poisonous snakes was used in some medical treatment. Okay, so how we grab the snake, the Dhamma determines the outcome. So what are the different ways that we can relate to the Dhamma? Okay. If we approach the Dhamma as a set of truths, then then claim that our possession of these truths make us superior to others, then we are approaching the Dhamma in the wrong end. We will end up finding fault and winning debates with others. Right? This is when the teachings become ossified into dogma. Right? The mistaken approach is rooted in a craving for certainty, right? So that's why in, in, in some other Buddhist traditions, they talk about the wisdom of uncertainty. <laughs> why? Because the nature of exist, our nature of exist, everything is subject to change, right? In fact, uh, from paragraph 15 onwards of this the discourse where the Buddha talks about non-self, all right? And he says that one way we can understand non-self is to understand that everything is subject to change. This so-called self that we say is ours, this body that we say is ours, these feelings that we say is ours, this perception that we say is ours, this intention that we say is ours, this consciousness through the six sense doors that we say is ours, they are subject to change. They are always constantly changing. And something that is always constantly changing, can you hold on to it? You can't. Feelings, for example, surely you want happy feelings to always remain, isn't it? But can you? You can't. Because you can't, it is unsatisfactory. 
<laughs> you see? Because you can't hold on to it the way you want it. It's satisfactory. And those feelings that you do not want keep on coming back. <laughs> People that you don't like, you keep on seeing them. You, know? you shift house, you move to another house. Same type of neighbor also, also there. Cannot run away. So that is aversion. Aversion. Isn't it? Right? That is why in the Satipatthana Sutta, if you remember, the four refrains, first you practice mindfulness, you have you know, be ardent, you must be, uh, you must have satima, you must have mindfulness, you must have sampajana, you must have clear knowing, and you are free from, from attachments to the world and aversion to it. Remember the four, four refrains? I understand many of you are a seasoned or veteran meditators, so you are familiar with these four, four, re, four refrains, which also found in the Anapana Sati Sutta. Isn't it? So when we practice it, so we remember this. Right? How does it relate to our everyday life? It's so relevant, isn't it? We can actually see it. Okay? Right. So remember, don't turn the Dhamma into, uh, in, in, into dogma. <laughs> don't turn the Dhamma into, into dogma. Right? So the late chief used to say, the Dharma will always be the same, will always be the truth. But what will change is Buddhism. Buddhism will change. And you cannot run away from that. That's why you have Thai Buddhism, and within Thai Buddhism, you've got separate branches. You've got Burmese Buddhism, you've got Chinese Buddhism, you've got Japanese Buddhism. Now you have American Buddhism. <laughs> you got you got European Buddhism, right? Indian Buddhism. Right? Next week I'll be going to India, you know. So so I'll be talking to Indian Buddhists. So Indian Buddhism. So it, it's different. But are we sitting together and talking about four noble truth? Uh, that's the that's the key. If we are not talking about four noble truth, if I go and talk to um, uh, uh, say I go to a Buddhist group and they say today we talk about five noble truths. <laughs> I think better not better not continue on that. <laughs> All right. Okay. So skillful grasping. This is a word I've used from Achantani Saro. You can also read his uh, he has got uh, he's got two talks about uh, I think he called it proper grasping and, and proper letting go. Right? So you can also use so I've just used his words, right? The correct way to grasp the Dhamma. See the word grabs, you always think grasping is bad, isn't it? Right? The way to grasp the Dharma is to understand the teachings as practical and ethical guidelines for living in an uncertain, contingent world. Our world is very uncertain. Right? You, don't need the, 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 you don't need the American management gurus to tell you that this world is VUCA, isn't it? Yeah, you know VUCA, right? V-U-C-A, isn't it? In management, somewhere in management, you heard of the word VUCA. So when, you know, in some of my, my leadership sessions, in, in the West, so they said VUCA. I, I told them, yeah, this concept of VUCA, 2,600 years ago, Indian pundits were already talking about that. <laughs> okay? So the correct way to grasp the Dharma is understand the teaching as practical, ethical guidelines for living in uncertain country. While we are part of the web of causes and conditions, we also have the capacity to realize nibbanic moments in which we can be free of reactivity and greed, hatred, and delusion. All right? These two dimensions, conditionality and the potential for non-reactivity, are the core of the Dhamma. Right? Again, you know, this word non-reactivity. In meditation, right, we always learn, like, especially in mindfulness, we, we learn the importance of being able to uh, cultivate that attitude of being able to respond rather than simply reacting. Most of the time we react. If somebody says something that is not pleasant to the ears, we react. With anger, we react with uh, unhappiness. But if we respond, then we have a little gap there, a time gap there for us to, to think. How should we respond? All right? So I think that's what we mind training in, in Buddhist teaching is all about. All right? So I will not use meditation, but mind training. We're actually basically training our mind. That's, the, that's the, the very essence of it. So the last one is a parable of the rough. Okay? Uh, though the rough simile gives rise to the idea that the Dhamma is to be let go, all right, the snake simile explains that the Dhamma has to be grabs, all right. The trick is how to grab it properly. Okay? Now, if we go back to the, to the Four Noble Truths, which is the essence of our teachings, right? The Four Noble Truths, the first truth is quite clear, everybody knows about it, Dukkha, right, unsatisfactory. 
The second noble truth is what? What is the second noble truth? The cause. And what is the cause? Tanha. Tanha is craving, right? Tanha, you use Tanha. Tanha is a Pali word. Actually, the Sanskrit word gives a better understanding because in Sanskrit, it's called Trishna. Trishna, the, the English word thirsty, comes from the word Trishna. So we're always thirsty. Thirsty for one, you have more. All right? But how do we convert this thirst that we have into something positive? That is why in Buddhism, they have another word called Chanda. Have you heard of the word Chanda? Right? Chanda is the will, that, that, that positive will. All right? If you don't develop, if you don't transform your cravings into positive, then you always have a craving for, you know, for sense, desire, sense, your indulgence will, will be there. So how do we convert that emotional energy that we have into something positive? All right? So uh, some of you have heard of the word Tantra, right? Tantra. So Tantra is actually about how do we convert all those negative thoughts that we have into something positive? So Buddhism is slightly different from trying to suppress all those negative thoughts that we have. But it's to recognize that, yes, we have that thought. We, we, we do have those, those thoughts. How, and those thoughts are energy, they're, they're powerful energies. How do we convert that? How do we transform that? Right? How do we transform that? And today we know that actually that can be done through mind training. Why? Because our mind is malleable. And how do we know that? thanks to modern science of neuroplasticity. Modern science in neuroplasticity says that actually our mind is malleable. You can change. That's so why every year, His Holiness the Dalai Lama have got dialogues with some of the leading neuroscientists and psychologists to understand our mind, how we can actually transform our, our, our mind. In other words, deep within our mind are a lot of gems and positive qualities. Why are we not and developing those 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 things all right so so we can understand from that perspective then we can trans transform our mind there's a lot of uh, confidence that we can do it okay so he says that uh, when applied to the rough simile what is clear is one has to hold on to the rough properly in order to cross the river so while we are still here we need to hold on to the teachings not to let go. You don't let go of everything. You can't let go even of the teachings. You can't. You can't let go of this self because you need this self. This self, you need to be healthy, isn't it? You are not healthy, you are sick. Can you sit here and meditate? Can you sit here and listen to the talk? You can't. So you need to take care of this body. You need to take care of self. You say, I've got no self. <laughs> See, I've got no, no self. There's no need to take care of this body, isn't it? <laughs> no, that's not true, isn't it? But you need to take care of this body. Oh, that's the small self. Not the big self. <laughs> That's a small self. After a while, then you realize that oh, you, you don't you don't need, need that. So when applied to the rough simile, what is clear one is to hold on to the rough properly. Okay. So there's the last two, three paragraphs. Because I will show you how the Dharma is similar to the rough, being for the purpose of crossing over, not for the purpose of grasping. Right? So you know if you grasp it, then the Dharma becomes dogma. Dharma becomes dogma. Listen and attend closely to what I shall say. This is what the Buddha said. Because suppose a man in the course of a journey saw a great expanse of water whose near shore was dangerous and fearful and whose further shore was safe and free from fear. But there was no ferry boat or bridge going to the other shore. He needs to cross over to the other shore. So what should he should do? All right. Then he says, I collect grass, twigs, branches, leaves, and bind them together with a rough. And suppose by that rough, and making an effort with my hands and feet, I got safely across to the other shore. So of course, you have to understand, this is the, the, the imagery in India, right? You know, in India, a lot of rivers, right? The Hindus, the Ganges, the Brahmaputra. So when there's heavy rain, you know, they have small, small tributaries, rivers. So very difficult to cross from one end to the other. So you need that. But the other simile the Buddha used is the simile of the flood, crossing the flood. The Oga, O-G-H-A. You heard of that, right? In the Sangyuta Nikaya, Oga Sutta. So in the Oga Sutta, the Buddha says, we are like on the other shore, we cross over the other shore. It talks about the flood, cross over the flood, the flood of delusion. So in the same, same analogy, same simile, right? You must have heard simile of the, 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 the flood, right? Crossing the flood. 
So now he came across. He got safely across to the other shore. And then the man collected, okay? And when he has got across and had arrived at the far shore, he might think thus, this raft has been very helpful to me. Since supported by it and making an effort with my hands and feet, I got safely across to the further shore. Suppose I were to hose it on my head and load it on my shoulder and then go wherever I want. Now, because what do you think? By doing so, would that man be doing what should be done with that raft? You have crossed over already. So do you still carry the raft with you? You don't. So you just leave it there. By doing what would that man be doing that should be done with that raft? Here, because when that man got across and had arrived at the further shore, he might think that this raft has been very helpful to me since supported by it and making an effort with my hands and feet, I got safely across to the far shore. Suppose I were to haul it onto the dry land or set it adrift in the water and then go wherever I want. All right? So very practical, isn't it? Now, because it is by so doing that that man would be doing what should be done with that raft. So I've shown you how the Dhamma is similar to a raft, being for the purpose of crossing over, not for the purpose of grasping. So don't be dogmatic with whatever you have heard, whatever you are practicing. Okay? So once you have crossed, so because when you know the Dhamma to be, is to be similar to a raft, you should abandon even good states. How much more bad states? <laughs> so, so this concludes that the short, these are Bhikkhu Bodhi's translation, right? So I've just, I just take it literally here so that you can read the actual translation. So here what he's saying is that as long as we are still here, I think all of us are still here, so we still need the rough. So please don't let go the rough. All right? Please don't let go the rough. Please don't say after today, stop, no more rough. You still need that rough. All right? Until we have attained, until we have crossed over, so we still need that rough. But we must not grab the, the, the rough. You see the, 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 the rough as something that is guide us along as a skillful means. All right? Skillful means. Okay? So I think it's a very beautiful analogy here about the, about the rough. So it's a gradual path, isn't it? It's a gradual path. Can you just take away? You can. And this concept of a gradual path, in so many suttas, I just give you three. All right? You can, you, you, as usual, you can go back, you can Google it, right? Just as the ocean has a gradual shelf, again, another simile about the ocean, all right? A gradual slope, a gradual inclination with a sudden drop off only after a long stretch, all right? In the same way, this doctrine and discipline, Dhamma Vina, has a gradual training, a gradual performance, a gradual progression, it's a penetration to gnosis. Gnosis means knowledge, right? It's the old English word, gnosis, only after a long stretch. So, so we are on a journey. We are on a journey. So as long as we are on a journey, we, we just need signposts along the way. So the, the, the good teachers that we have, the Kalyana Mitas that we have, they are the, the, the teachers that guide us along, along, the, along the path. Right? So the Buddha's advice is, misunderstanding and misapplying the teachings of not-self led to a confused ticket of views that Arita was never able to extricate himself. This is the conclusion of the suttas, which unfortunately we did not have time to, to go through, but I'm just giving you the conclusion, right? So his confusion led him teaching a false and misleading dharma to others and continue his own clinging, aversion and delusion. Right? So this sutta gives you the impression that the, that the Buddha can be a very stern person, isn't it? can be a serious and stern. Almost, sometimes we think, oh, Buddha is a very jolly, jolly, always happy, you know, very happy. <laughs> and some even depict him with a big stummy, you know, so Obviously, that's, that's not true. Right? So the Buddha can be very firm, can be very stern, especially when his teachings have been misinterpreted. When he felt that it's been misinterpreted, he will want to rectify it. But I did not explain it, but in the, in the discourse, you'll notice that when the Buddha heard that Arita had such views, he did not immediately disparage Arita or criticize Arita. He did not. He, in fact, asked the monks to invite Arita to come and the Buddha himself personally asked Arita, Arita, is it true that this is what you said? You see? So that is a very different approach than we jumping the conclusion. Oh, is that what he said about me? You, you jump the conclusion. So we react. The Buddha did not react. The Buddha responded. The Buddha responded to what his monks were saying about Arita. And he told Arita, come. 
please explain, is that what you say? And of course, when Arita said that, Buddha said, that's not what I teach. Right? That's not what, what I teach. Okay? So the Buddha was very, was, was very what we call, uh, very didactic in that sense. Right? He's his, his skill. Okay? So the conclusion is the Buddha teaches that right view arises from Dharma practice within the framework of the Eightfold Path. Where the past, present, or future, where the form, feeling, perception, mental, fabrication, or consciousness, the five aggregates, huh? through right view, I know that this is not mine. This is not myself. This is not what I am. So these three uh, express in detail from para 15 onwards in this discourse. Okay? Okay, uh, okay. Knowing what is not I, they grow disenchanted with forms, feed the growth of the five aggregates. So, so this, this actually concludes the sutta. And dukkha arises from an incorrect view of what constitutes a self and how this self interacts all right, with the world. From this incorrect view, ideas of what is necessary to survive and attain some happiness and security develop. Once this wrong view of self is developed, concepts are formed to rationalize and justify holding views, even views that continuously prove to lead to more destruction and suffering. All right? Okay, so the Eightfold Path allows us to recognize and release all views arising from ignorance and develop right view. Until we fully realize the Eightfold Path, we need to hold on to the teachings correctly, like how we grab the neck of the snake, not the tail. Right? The simile you grab the, grab the snake. Only, when, only then can we release the rough that brings us from this shore to the other shore, where we will experience true peace and happiness. So that sums up these uh, two similes about the holding on. So what do we hold on? We still need to hold on, but hold on properly to the teachings. All right? What should we let go? We should let go properly after we have realized the teachings. I think that is the essence of it. So it is, uh, it is like you say, a work in progress, right? <laughs> work in, in progress as far as our spiritual practice is concerned. So we don't have to, to, to feel intimidated if we think that, oh, we are so far from the goal. Because everybody, we all have our own karma. We bring with us our own karma. Some of us may, 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 may be able to go faster, some people will go slower. But surely we will reach our goal if we follow the teachings, if we always anchor our practice on the Eightfold Path, then you will not go wrong. Okay? So, I think that should be enough. 5 to 11. So, if we have until 11 15, right? So, if you have some questions, then we, we can discuss. Yeah. Uh, hi, brother. Mm. Okay, so I want to ask that. Uh, you mentioned that unskillful is you want to one-up mm. other people, correct? You use the Dharma to mm. one-up another ah. person is an unskillful act. But what if you want to one up yourself? Means, example, when your unwholesome thoughts come in, but you want to one up that unwholesome thought, is that skillful or unskillful? Well, if it is an unwholesome thought, it is an unskillful thought. It's an unskillful thought, right? Uh -huh. so, so, because of your right understanding, right view, so you want to reduce the unskillful thought. So, of course, you convert the unskillful thought into a skillful thought. Mm -hmm. So, it's one up. Ah, yes. That is, of course, it is skillful. Uh, okay. Like the you know in the eight four parts they talk about efforts four right effort the the, the 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 right effort in four ways the one pair is good thoughts that have not yet arisen so you want to arise those good thoughts once the good thoughts have arisen you want to maintain right unskillful thoughts unskillful thoughts have not arisen you will not create conditions for them to arise mm. but if it has arisen you make an effort to overcome it. Right. So first, that's why first we need to investigate whether it is a skillful thought or a not a skillful thought. Okay. Okay. I understand. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? Yeah. You don't have to ask questions. You can add on your 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 thoughts. <laughs> uh, very many have a question. Mm. So, with regards to um, using the Dharma to kind of, in a way, win debate, right? Sometimes outwardly, perhaps, um, mm. Our? I mean, outwardly, oh, yeah. someone may be intending to, like, 
use the Dhamma to kind of like challenge other people. I mean, not challenge, but to um, answer certain questions, uh, answer other people. Uh, but if the intention is one of uh, compassion for the other mm. person, because, you know, uh, when you see someone whose views are really distorted and you just really want to help them, uh, create the conditions for them to correct their views, uh, and it ends up, you know, be becoming a debate. So how do we sort of like skillfully navigate this in the future? Yeah. yeah. I, th I, I think you already mentioned that word. It all boils back to our motivation, our intention, isn't it? All right? If our intention or motivation is really that uh, we realize that so-and-so has taken something, has spoken something that is not in, in line with the Dhamma as you have understood it, then you can always correct it and, and say, from my understanding of the sources where it comes from, you know, uh, that doesn't seem to be in line with what Buddha has taught. So all you need to do is provide the facts. That's why I think it's very important for us to know the sources where people make, make certain statements. You know? If we can uh, substantiate it, for, for example, say in this, this particular discourse, and then it makes it difficult for the other party to continue to, to, to argue. But if we ourselves also do not have, have uh, something to fall back on, then it's only our opinions, then of course it end up two different opinions arguing. Isn't it? I think, as I always said, when, for, for example, you know, uh, I always believe that if I share a Dharma talk, it's not, so, it's not important what I think. You know? My job here, if any society invites me, is to, if they want to talk on this sutta, is to try to find an authentic source, say Bhikkhu Bodhi's translation or Tanisaro's translation, and to share what I understand of, from that discourse. Whether you agree or you don't agree, that's a separate thing. You know, so if we can, I think if we adopt that approach, then, number one, there's less argument, right? For example, you can talk to a Christian and say, I believe in God. You can, you can quote them all the available sources, Brahma Jala, Sutta, or Buridatta, Jataka, or, or anything, but they will, not, they will not accept it, isn't it? So it's, in those cases, it is best to, to talk about the weather, whether it's going to rain or it's not going to rain. But if the person is sincere in wanting to know about the Dhamma, if he's sincere about the knowing the, the Dharma, and but you realize that he has got some misconception, then we sh our intention is to guide him as a Kalyana Mita, as a spiritual. So back to our intention. Huh? Back to our intention. Thank you, Brother Benny. Any other questions or comments? You know, I said the weather because this what you know when I was in in sixth form, I was studying in a Catholic school. The the brother director, brother Celestine, I always remember it. You know, he's a Catholic, and at that time, there was a lot of evangelicals, and they tried to convert the Catholics. So he said, one day, this evangelical came to talk to him. He said, do you know that your Bible that you hold is the wrong Bible? So he said, can I explain to him that Bible is the Bible? So I, I told this guy, let's talk about the weather today. <laughs> then we can agree. So, so I, I learned from Brother Celestine. <laughs> So you see, so if their intention is not to, to really find out the, the truth, but the intention is to challenge you, then you've got to be wise enough. That maybe you don't further en en engage, or if, he's, if he continues to, <laughs> to, to argue with you, just let it be. Otherwise, you end up having a lot of anger, isn't it? <laughs> so, so we don't want that either. Thank you. Okay, anything else? We have time for quite a lot of questions, actually. Maybe mm. three more questions. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Yes, yes. Brother, you talk about uh, how about the layperson and also the monks, like mm. they have different roles, right? Mm. Uh, I'm just a simple question. Uh, then how about the monks in Japan where they can marry so mm. does it mean they're 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 not following the Vinaya or like? Uh, of course they are not because they are not monks. They are priests. Then, then what's the difference? Like? Oh, we can have a talk on that lah. <laughs> <coughs> it's not only in Japan; even in Korea. All right. So they they have a married clergy. Uh, there's a history be behind it. All right. So during the Meiji period. Mm. So the, the, the government enact a, a rule where they, they actually ask the monks to 
give up the ropes and you know and have and marry you know and, and mm. but not all uh, uh, agree so so as a result a large number of uh, of of so called then we don't call them monks uh, they are priests uh, priests uh, they are priests all right so you find that in Japan it's called the uh, for example in the uh, the jodo shinshu tradition you know buddhism of course from india you went to korea korea went to china mm. all right in china all the buddhist monks are celibates so they follow the they they are no chinese priests mm. I, I don't mean the taoist priests i mean buddhist <laughs> buddhist monks so in china whether it is the the, the pure land or the chan or the tantai they are, they are all monks they are all mm. celibates but when Buddhism went from from China to Korea, Korea to Japan, um, many they got different schools. All the schools in China came to Japan, established in in Japan, and they, they took on Japanese names, mm. like the Pure Land School in China, the Amitabha School. So in Japan, it becomes the the Jodo, the, the Shin Shin Buddhism, not Shinto, uh, Shin Buddhism. And Shin Buddhism broke off into Jodo Shinshu and and and, and Jodo. So that school, the they are priests. So they own temples, and when they die, their children take over the temple. So that's the Japanese tradition. But in some schools in in, in Japanese Buddhism, like Zen Buddhism, some Zen uh, Buddhists are celibates. So they are monks. They are monks, and nuns. <laughs> okay, they are monks and and nuns. Wait, let, let me finish a little bit more. Similarly, in Tibet, because someone may, may ask, in, in Tibet, not every so-called Lama that you see is a monk, you know. Mm. You may call him Lama. Lama means what? What does the word Lama mean? Teacher. Teacher, yeah, exactly. It means Guru. When you say Lama, Lama Ji, that means Guru. It means a, a teacher, like Achan. Uh, achan is a teacher, you know. You can be a university professor in Thailand, you can call him an Achan. It doesn't mean he's a monk, you know. <laughs> all right. So in Tibet, not all are, are monks. The Dalai Lama is a monk. Karmapa is, is a monk. But you know there are four schools in Tibetan Buddhism. All right. The Sakya school, for example, the head Sakya Trizin, he's not a monk. He has got a family, mm. but he wears like a monk <laughs> because that's the culture. Is it? That's their tradition. All right. If he's a monk, how do you know he's a monk? Then he has got the name called Gilong. Gilong is the Tibetan word for monk. G-E-L-O-N-G. Like Biku lah. Biku. Uh, okay. All right. Thank you, brother. Sorry. So please, not every Tibetan lama you see is a monk. Huh? They, are, they, are, they are not. Uh, they can have family. You know. Yes. So, brother uh, Benny, related to his question. So, does it mean that... Uh, for the teaching of the Dharma, as long as you follow the basic like Four Noble Truths, the Karma and all this, then we can regard it as a real dharma, uh, dharma. Whether the priest or the the are they uh, celebrate or are they what is not it's not the issue, is it? Well, uh, I okay, uh, any follow up? Uh, yeah. uh, one of them like uh, the Nichiren, are they regarded as Buddhist? Because some of them claim they are not. So are they teaching, is it the, the criteria to be uh, whether we mean in inverted comma, the real Buddhism teaching or is it uh, you have to teach four noble truths, you have to teach this the basic way. So when like Nichiren, why is it there is a controversial? Mm. Thank you. Okay. You know, this is, a, this is a question that has been debated for a long time. I think way back in the 50s when they started this World Fellowship of Buddhists, which is not, not very active and anyway. So they, they came up with certain guidelines, whether you, whatever school that you follow, Theravada, Mahayana, Vajrayana, there are certain guidelines, the whole set of it. Four Nubus is obviously one of it. The other one is accepting Shakyamuni Buddha. Accepting Shakyamuni Buddha as our main teacher. All right? So accepting that. Shakyamuni, it is, uh, well, Gautama Buddha. Oh, Gautama. Gautama. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As the main, as your main teacher. So whether you are like his, like the Dalai Lama, you visit his temple in Dharamsala. The first thing that when I when I go to Dharamsala, I go to that temple. I'll I'll pay respect. Is Shakyamuni Buddha? 
Well, I mean, Gautama Buddha. <laughs> we in the Mahayana tradition, they don't use Gautama Buddha. They use Shakyamuni Buddha. That means the the, the sage of the Sakyas. Right? So, <clears throat> it's actually Gautama Buddha. So that is the most Nichiren Buddhists. Unfortunately, don't accept Shakyamuni Buddha. They accept Nichiren Daishonin, the founder, as their teacher. So that is the distinction. Yeah. So that is why, for example, in Malaysia, the Nichiren groups are under the Soka Gakkai. Mm. <coughs> Even though they consider themselves as Buddhists, but for example, they are not members of MBA, they are not members of YBAM. You know, they are, are they Mahayana, but they are not. They are not recognized at that. You see, but, but they still teach four noble truths. They still believe in. They have. Birth, they karma. even have karma. They have all this. But one very significant. This is the only criteria. criteria. Thank you. <clears throat> but having said that, uh, <clears throat> Nichiren Buddhism has got very very schools. You know, you got Nichiren. Uh, you got Nichiren Shu, Nichiren Shoshu. So some schools are, are more open to seeing, accepting Gaut, uh, Gautama Buddha. Some are direct, like Soka Gakkai. <coughs> I think they are very clear that they don't. <laughs> to, to them, Sakyamuni Buddha is not the, the their main focus. <coughs> okay, sorry. Yeah, yeah I'm Brad uh, Two questions. One is uh, the group called Moral of Buddhism. Uh, how does it fit in? I don't know much about that group. Okay. All right? I'm not sure, so I, I will not be able to comment. I think it's a fairly new group. Yeah. It's a Taiwanese, is it? It's a Taiwanese group? Chinese Sometimes. group, but they uh, say they follow <coughs> Tibetan teachings. Uh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Lambrin or something. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, I don't know enough, but uh, if Lambrin, is, you know Lambrin? Lambrin is the Tibetan uh, text which Lama Atisha just now mentioned. Lama Atisha actually felt that Buddhism was so corrupted in Tibet, so he wanted to bring back the essence of Buddhism. So he actually collated all the the main teachings. So, for example, into his classic text called "The Lamb on the Path to Enlightenment." That's the classic text for Lamrim. So, from that classic text, the path to lamb to a uh, lamb on, on the path to enlightenment. Then you got subsequent uh, many many. Lambrim, Lama Songkapa, Lambrim, and, and so on. So this Chinese group, <laughs> so I've I've heard that they may not really follow the, the authentic Lambrim. I do not know, so I'm not in a position to comment on that. Yeah. Okay. I think they are they are quite active here. Yeah. They try to they try to contact, but in the in the thank you. So in the Vajrayana Buddhist Council, they are also not a member as yet, as far as I understand it. Yeah, thanks. Okay, another question. <clears throat> Regarding uh, criticism, you know, is it okay to point out to others that they are breaking precepts or benign rules or should we just keep quiet? You mean to the monks? To lay people or monks. Or, or monks is maybe monks to monks. Uh. <laughs> uh, monks are, to monks, lay people uh. cannot comment on monks. Right? Cannot, no? <laughs> <laughs> I think if, if, for example, it depends, you know, if, if it's a within our Buddhist circles, you know, and if we know that uh, a person is, is not following the precept, then we, we, we can always, with good intention, highlight and say, hey, you know, are you, uh, are you, are you do, do you know that this is against the precept? Just to highlight to, 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 to them. I think it's good as long as our intention is to, to guide the person, why not, you know? But if the person knows that he's breaking the precept, he still continues to do it, then we can tell we can tell him, you know, okay, if you can't keep this person, means you keep the other four closely. <laughs> because they are not commandments, right? If for whatever reason he says he can't keep, say, first precept, let's say he's a I don't know, he's a, he's a fisherman or, or, or whatever, rather than condemning him, then we can say, okay, we understand the, the situation, but don't forget you got four more. <laughs> so that's no reason for you not to keep the other four, isn't it? It's better than not keeping at all. So we under, need to understand the circumstances of the people, why they are doing it, yeah? Okay. There, are, there, are, uh, there are a lot of many other fringe groups uh, today. Theravada side, not so many. Well, even that they have, like for example, someone talks about the group from Thailand, you know, the Dhammakaya. You know, some people regard them as a fringe group. 
you know again i'm no position to to pass judgment i cannot say this is not but there are some group in the tibetan tradition that they worship a particular deity uh, which is holiness and all the other heads of schools have said we should not be doing that because our refuge should be buddha not the deities right i think that's the i think there was one one group here in malaysia that does that so they try to get admitted into the VBCM, and I, I was in the discussion, and I said, "You, you, you, you include them. Their practices a direct contradiction to what our spiritual teacher Dalai Lama has, has asked them not to do. So, do you want to admit them? And then they they were not admitted. You know. So, so sometimes like the Buddha with, Ar with Arita, you know, when you are when it is obvious that you are in transgressing the, the actual teaching, you've got to make a stand. You've got to make a stand. All right? Okay? Yeah. Okay. That's my personal view. Re regarding Su Su Suchi. Yeah, yeah Suchi is a, is a mainstream Buddhist group. <laughs> so it's well accepted, you know. So all Buddhist groups like Fokuang, you know, Dhamma Drum, so they are well well accepted. Except that their focus uh, for Suchi is they're more on um, you know charity, compassion, helping, you know. That's the the focus, right? Dhamma drum, Fakusan, you know. So their focus is on meditation. Fokuan, they also in they are also in missionary work. So it is said that in Taiwan there are these three, three great uh, great masters. Of course, uh, uh, Master Xing Yin passed away, lah. Master Sheng Yan also passed away. So only left the Suchi, the nun, right? So Suchi is a established, is a mainstream Buddhist group. No controversy and. Uh, all well accepted, like Fu Kuang and uh, Fa Kusan. Uh, have you heard of this? I just heard about it. Pure Buddhism Center. Mm. Pure Buddhism. It's a very important thing, is it? Mm. Yeah. yeah. It's one of those Chinese groups. Uh, I'm not I, so. I think they are Chinese based or is it Taiwanese based? Uh? Yeah, yeah. Usually they are Taiwanese based. Uh. Yeah, so I, I I thought of that. In fact, that group has been around a long time. Even when I was, uh, I, I just heard about it in the market. Yeah, yeah, market. yeah, yeah. They, they, they have been they've been around. So I do not know enough of, enough of them. You see, one criteria is if the if the focus is always on the teacher, then we have got to be very careful. Then it becomes like a cult. Like a cult yeah. uh, you see, like for example, even Fu Kuang. Of course, we respect uh, Master Sing Yin a lot. But Master Sing Yin never put himself like a, like a cult, really. you know. Uh, he will never say he's the only master. I remember many years ago when Master Sing Yin came, our late chief was around. We organized, uh, I was still very young, very active. So <laughs> we organized a seminar in Penang called Two Masters, One Message. So Master Sing Yin can accept that he just says our late chief is a master, he's a master. He never said, I'm the only master. You see, so that's the difference. You know, the the venerable Sheng Yan Fakusan, he had a he had a dialogue with Dalai Lama and both of them talked like like friends and they never said you must always, you know, believe in me. And the Dalai Lama himself said, despite what the world thinks, well, he said, Look, I'm just a simple Buddhist monk. This is Dalai Lama's own words. I'm just a simple Buddhist monk. Now if if all those so called great masters, if they make those kind of statements that I'd respect them. But chances are they will tell you that you know they have already attained what stage uh, this that stage yeah. isn't it uh, then we got to be very careful because for example in the parajikas uh, uh, i think par parajikas if a if, if if a monk for example says that he has attained you know when expect especially when he has not not attained, he has broken the parajika and the best part is those who have attained don't go around telling people they've attained <laughs> uh, have you ever heard achancha telling people you know i'm really an arahan no <laughs> His disciple can say that about him. That's fine. <laughs> Asan Chan never said that. Masi Sayado, I think Brother Kwek knows very well. Has he ever said, I'm an enlightened being? No. Lady Sayado, they never said that. But lay people, <laughs> we said because of our dealing with that. That's different. I'm saying when they're mastered themselves. Many years ago, I don't want to mention the name. There was one monk who, was, who used to come to Malaysia. Very pop popular Thai monk. He, he will start having exhibition. It was in the nineties. Everybody said he's a such a great, wonderful monk. A lot of devotees. One day, I I saw he had an exhibition at Brick, Brickfields Temple, and one of the slides where he said that he he gained enlightenment at this place. 
at one of the cavemen. When I read that, I told myself, gee, he's a Theravada monk. Why would he make those kind of statements publicly? And, you know, I can't read his mind, but <laughs> within less than six months, he was defrocked in Thailand. He was charged and he had to, he had to run away and he went to the UK. I think he, went, he started changing the purple robes. I, I think you know who I'm referring to, but I don't want to mention this name. So we must be very careful. Is it our Chinese local monk? No, no, no. He's a Thai, Thai monk. Thai monk. Thai monk. Uh, he was very close to Venerable Mahinda at that time. But, you know, I mean, I don't want to disparage these people. But what I'm saying is that we must be very careful when we, when we come across those kind of things. Go for the mainstream Buddhist teachings. There are enough groups. There are enough groups. If you're on meditation, there are enough meditation groups. Slang of Vipassana, Wisdom Center, where else you have now? And now you have Dhamma Earth, so, so many. Uh, BGF, of course. <laughs> BGF. So there are so many of those mainstream. You know, we always said, uh, once the Dalai Lama was asked, how do you know that it is authentic? He said, trace the lineage. Trace the lineage. See who is the teacher. Uh, that, that is a good guy. He said, you trace the, the, the teacher. Whether it's Chinese or Tibetan or Theravada, you trace to the teacher. You see? Like you trace to Achan Cha, or you trace to Lady Sayadaw or Mahasi Sayadaw. You, know, you trace to all those, or Ting Yat Han, you know, for that matter. Yeah. All the accepted teachers are no controversial ones. <laughs> huh? Okay? Rituals. That's a topic for another talk. <laughs> rituals are rituals are an are a means to an end. Rituals are never an end in itself. Right? Never an end in itself. But rituals are also closely linked to tradition, to culture. Certain cultures love rituals more than others. Alright? Um, if if you are following the the, the 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 meditation lineage hardly any ritual, right? But if you are, if you are following the, 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 the basic traditional one, there's a lot of ritual. But the important thing is, do people take ritual as an end in itself or as a means to understanding something? If rituals help to bring people together, and then when people are together, you give them Dharma teachings or you give them meditation, then people benefit, right? But if you make rituals an end in itself, then I think that's not... The proper Buddhist way. Right? When I remember this is his, the Dalai Lama's response about so many rituals in Tibetan Buddhism. Yeah. He said that, in fact, no, I wasn't the one who asked him this question. Somebody in my group asked him, why is it that in Tibetan Buddhism so many rituals? His reply is, I think it's recorded in one of the CDs. No? His reply was, he has been trying as best as he can to tell the, the Tibetan, stop all these rituals. So emphasize more on education. That, that's his, his, his exact word. Yeah, but he, he also acknowledges sometimes beyond his control. People like rituals. You, 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 you go to any Thai temple, the Thai monks sit there, even here when they give Dhamma teaching, the people say, can you give me blessing or not? <laughs> you see? Um, brother, uh, back to the question, we, maybe similar question with the uh, Nichiren or Soka Gakkai. Um, what about like, uh, because I was part of uh, a branch of Ikuan Tao called Milita Tao. Ikuan Tao. But it's a branch of mm. it, one of the branch, it's very big in Indonesia, mm. especially in uh, Sumatra. Mm. Um, and in fact, they've been recognized as one of the Buddhist branch. Right. But if you ask them, right, like, uh, because you mentioned that one of the commonalities is Four Noble Truths, uh, accepting Sakyamuni Buddha or Gautama Buddha as the main teacher. But they will say they, 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 they accept that. In fact, their temples, if you see it, is just like normal, uh, any normal Mahayana temple. They celebrate Vesa, uh, but more towards Mahayana. La. But they have their own sets of teachers as well. But if, they, if you ask them, like, um, do you accept Gautama Buddha as a teacher? Do you accept the, the, the Tipitaka? They will say yes, but they have their own teachings. So how does that work? So are they considered Buddhist or not? 
Yeah, I, I, <coughs> again, I don't know enough of Ikhwan Tao yeah. to, to comment, but as far as I understand, the, the, the major Buddhist groups in Malaysia don't recognize them. Right? That, that much I, 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 I can say. Uh, again, doctrinally, I do not know enough for me to, to, to make any, any comments on the Ikhwan Tao. Right? Because the point is like, um, if, they, if they accept this, uh, this guideline, right? Technically, they're inward, so that's well, just, yeah. just my thought. Lah. Yeah, but do, do they really take refuge in the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha? Or do they just regard the, the state? Like, for example, Hindus also accept Shakyamuni ah, yeah. Buddha. Similarly like that as well. <laughs> you see? Like, I, when I was in Shala, I know the Shala Buddhist society. Yeah? Every time, a lot of Indians will, will come. You know that Kota Kumuning area, a lot of Indians, right? So they'll come, they also bow, you know, they bow. But do they really accept Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha as as the refuge, as we do. Uh, that I do not know. So we have to ask that very pertinent question. You see, Nichiren, I know they definitely don't take refuge in the, in, 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 in the Buddha. They take refuge in, in uh, this, who is that? Nichiren Dai, Dai Shonin. Right? So that much is clear. But Ikuan Tao, I'm not, sometimes they, I'm not saying about Ikuan Tao, but some, some groups, they camouflage. Yeah, yeah, they, 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 they camouflage by saying, oh yeah, yeah, I also believe in that. Tipitaka, I also got Tipitaka. Yeah. Lamrim, I also got, got Lamrim. But is it the same Lamrim that Lama Songkapa teaches? The same Lamrim that Lama Atisha teaches? I don't know. So we need to, to really ask. Uh, ask uh. So my point is, if you are not clear, why don't we just go to the mainstream Buddhist group? <laughs> that's, that's my point. If you do not know. Un unless you have a special inclination for Ikuan Tao. Then that's fine. Yeah, because that's a keyword. Like it's very big in yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. a certain place. And right. it becomes uh, people synonymize Buddhism as uh, uh, that particular sect. So, yes, yeah. yeah. You, you are absolutely right. I remember when I was in, 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 in school, people always associate Buddhism with all those so-called neo-Taoist practices. <laughs> and I think that has changed. Today, people understand that is actually that's not even Taoism. You know, in the, there's a consultative council of Buddhism, Christianity, Hinduism, and Taoism, right? You, there's a head there, there's a Taoist. I think he's a, he's a professor at University of Malaya. You talk to him, he said, all oh, these are rubbish. And he, even he himself says, oh, this is not Taoist. These are Chinese practices, you know. Chinese cultural practices that has come, come to us, you know. But, so Buddhism get a bad name. Ah, you, you know. <laughs> but I think today, I think thanks to like the late chief, you know, so he has really spent his life in his book, What Buddhists Believe, and so on, to kind of clarify. So that phase has... So we need to clarify. Uh, we need to, to, to clarify. Very important. Now we've got Yikuan Tao. <laughs> okay? All right? All right. Thank you. We should, we should stop. Okay. Thank you very much, Radha Benny, for the insightful uh, Dhamma talk as well as for answering our questions very skillfully, clarifying our doubts. Let's say sadhu three times again out of gratitude. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Uh, and right now we'd like to invite Brother Bobby to present a token of gratitude oh, yeah. to Brother Benny Thank for you sharing very much. For, uh, for your Dhamma Dana today. Uh, books. Benny loves books. So oh, okay. Let me see. Oh, okay. No, I don't have it. Thank you. Thanks, Ben. Okay, thank you.